How could a 68 million year old Tyrannosaurus rex bone still contain soft tissue? Several years ago, paleontologists were stunned to find soft and pliable tissue still remaining in dinosaur fossils. All experimental evidence shows that biological material will not survive for millions of years. Instead, this tissue presents direct biochemical evidence that the dinosaur fossils are only a few thousand years old. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, The Real Jurassic World with Dr. Kevin Anderson. Today's guest, Dr. Kevin Anderson, received his PhD in microbiology and was a research fellow at the National Institutes of Health. He has served as a university professor, taught graduate level molecular biology, and was the director of research for a biotech company. He has also written numerous technical publications and is currently the director of the Van Andel Creation Research Center in Arizona. Welcome, Dr. Anderson. It's my pleasure, thank you. It's great to have you on the show today. We got a great subject, the real Jurassic world. Yes. What is that about? What that is about is a whole re-understanding of what you're being told about Earth history. Let's take a look. See, if you are in a geology class or a paleontology class or even just a general science class, you'll likely be presented with something like this that shows all these eras of geologic times, the Cretaceous, the Triassic, the Mississippian, and all these ages, 33 million, 50 million, 100 million, 250 million. So that establishes in people's understanding that the Earth is vastly old and there's been all these periods of time where you had different types of animals. You know, the animals in the Triassic are not the same as the animals in the Pleiocene. And what that establishes in people's thinking is that not only is the Earth old, but look at how things have changed. Well, that's evolution, how different animals evolved into something else. And so when people look at this picture, this illustration, it very much supports the idea that all creatures have evolved. Mm -hmm. And I asked the question, what do we think of? We hear the word Jurassic. What do you think of? I think of the movies and big dinosaurs. And big and dinosaurs, exactly. Yeah. See, and, the, and not only have they set it up where you think of dinosaurs, but oh, Jurassic, that was, you know, that was 150 million years ago. Yeah, that yeah. was the era of dinosaurs. There were no humans, there were no dogs, there were no cats. So that's a whole different time in Earth history. And we've evolved since then. See, so it all works together to paint this picture of ancient times, evolutionary history totally contradictory to the biblical teachings. Well, let's look at what we really have in the dinosaur world. In the 1830s, a man named Charles Lyell wrote a book called Principles of Geology. And in Principles of Geology, he argued that all this geologic change is very slow, it takes a long time to form mountains, a long time to form canyons, a long time to form riverbeds. And so because change is so slow, then the earth history obviously has to be very old. Now what's interesting is that even in the 1830s, Charles Lyell admitted that his single biggest reason for his conclusions was not because of the scientific evidence. He was wanting to free the science from Moses. What he meant by that was, let's get Genesis out of scientific understanding so that we don't have a biblical view of earth history. We have a Lyell view of earth history. It's not that what Moses wrote of creation and the flood is an understanding of earth history. It is, no, no, no. Earth history has been going for millions and millions of years and what Moses wrote has nothing to do with that. And so Lyell recognized if I can get these long periods of time into our understanding of earth history, there's no room to fit Moses. There's no room to fit the Bible. So and is it fair to say Lyell had an agenda? He very much had an agenda. Hmm. Absolutely. So he wasn't just saying, oh, I wonder what, you know, the earth shows me about itself. Yes. He thought, yes. I like this idea yes. and I'm going to make it work. In fact, Charles Lyell was not a geologist. He was not a paleontologist. He wasn't even a scientist. He was a lawyer. Wow. And he used his legal expertise of argumentation and such to develop his arguments. And it had a lot less to do with science and evidence and more to do with what his agenda was to free the science 
from Moses. To get the Bible out of really the realm of exactly. fact. Exactly. So what he presented to us was if everything takes millions of years, then you've got the Bible timeline versus Lyell's timeline. And Lyell understood if I can make it my timeline, then people doubt the Bible timeline. If they doubt the Bible timeline, they doubt the Bible. Mm. And so it really became this contention that's still going on today. Now, Lyell's okay. book didn't take off right away, did it? It took a little bit of time. Well, it would have been like anything at that time. You didn't have Amazon. You didn't have <laughs> Internet. It, but it did also become very popular. And, in fact, it was very popular even when Charles Darwin, writing a lot, said that he owed a lot to his conclusions a lot of his conclusions to what he read in Lyell's writings. If he hadn't had the Lyell timeline, he'd never been able to argue his evolutionary views because mm. you couldn't argue evolutionary views in a you know malt in just a few thousand year timeline of Earth history. See, they got to change Earth history in order to fit in non-God views. Mm. Okay, let's then look at how dinosaurs fit into this, and I'm oh. going to present what I call the different view okay. of dinosaurs in Jurassic. So that's what we normally think of when we, we hear Jurassic, Correct. right? Correct. We're seeing... Yes, what we've just given you. Mm -hmm. Jurassic was a long time ago. That mm -hmm. was the time the dinosaurs lived. And all that's different now. You know, things have evolved since then. Yes. Well, let's look at what is going on anatomically in a bone. We've got to understand a bone first before we can understand someone I'm going to talk to you about. In a bone, you have a matrix of protein laid down that's called collagen. That's the most dominant protein in bone. And then cells in the bone will lay down a mineral matrix of calcium and phosphorus along this protein matrix. And this is really what bone looks like. We tend to think of bone as a rock, but it's not. It's living tissue. So, all right, an animal dies. Maybe they get buried. How do you turn this bone, this living tissue, into a fossil? Well, the most common way as we would understand how it occurs is you have groundwater bringing silica into the bone and washing the calcium and the phosphorus out of the bone. It's called replacement. And over time then, this replacement gets rid of all the tissue, all the collagen, all the bone mineral, and replaces it with the ground mineral, silica, iron, sulfur, etc., and you have a fossil. Now, the question is just how long does this take? Because what we're going to see is that apparently it takes more than 68 million years. Wow. In 2005, with two quick papers coming out, then after that in 2007, evidence was presented of tissue still in the femur of a Tronosaurus rex. This tissue was squishable, pliable, stretchable. It wasn't petrified or fossilized tissue. It was actual, still in its tissue state. So the cells were not made up of the silica or the iron? Correct. It correct. was made up of living or yes, one time living? Yes, it still contained protein. It still contained mm. lipids. It still contained the tissue material. It was still stretchable. It was still pliable. Wow. So obviously this particular T. rex femur hadn't fully fossilized, even though it's assigned age is 68 million years, which is why I say, well, how long does fossilization take? Because for this guy, apparently 68 million years isn't enough. He's not fully fossilized yet. Mm. What does that do? See, this presents a direct biochemical challenge to the assigned ages of all these geologic layers. Because if you have a fossil that's in a layer that's supposed to be 68, 70, 75 million years old, and yet it still contains all this pliable tissue and these proteins and such, wouldn't that be pretty strong evidence that it's not 68, 70, 75 million years? I mean, it would seem that they would not be able to deny that. It would seem that they have a major problem. Yes. How in the world do you explain what's supposed to be tens and tens, and in fact, in some instances, over a hundred million years old, that's still not fully fossilized, still has some tissue in it? You know, that's very difficult for me to explain, and this then, as I would say, is direct biochemical evidence to counter those ages. That 
guess what? These fossils aren't nearly as old. And if the fossils aren't as old as they're assigned to be, then neither are the rocks that they're found in. And then the whole dating scheme that we have become so familiar with starts falling apart. Wow, that sounds like a major challenge. It would be a major challenge. It is a major challenge, yes. The Creation Research Society wanted to do some research in this area also because we didn't want the evolutionist community to have total control over everything that was being published. Not that we were accusing them of necessarily saying something wrong or doing something wrong. We were just saying, we don't want them to control the narrative totally. We want to have some input in this as well. We want to make sure that some of the research we think should get done gets done. Well, that only makes sense. I mean, you're all scientists. You ought to be able to exactly. each come up with your own exactly. conclusions and then yes. argue from yes. the facts and rather present, than... Yeah, yeah, present our own data. So we developed what was called the iDino Project. Stands for Investigation of Dinosaur Intact Natural Osteo Tissue. From this, we have published a series of articles in our own publication, the Creation Research Society Quarterly. We've also produced a movie called Echoes of the Jurassic, and I have recently written a book of the same title. So we have several publications that have come from this uh, research so far, and we're, it's still ongoing. There'll be more coming out as we speak. This started in 2012. The Creation Research Society sponsored a team to go to eastern Montana and dig in what's called the Hell Creek Formation. That's a very common uh, geologic region in the Crustaceous era. This is supposedly younger than the Jurassic, okay? okay. But in the Crustaceous era. And the Hell Creek Formation is uh, where a lot of dinosaur bones are found. And it's an area where a lot of dinosaur bones that have had tissue have been found. And what we found on this particular adventure was a 46 and a half inch long brow horn of a triceratops. Now, a few things to notice just for fun. The end was exposed some, which is how we knew it was there. But the end's obviously been weathered off. So who knows how long this original horn was? It probably was well over 48 inches, maybe even 50 inches. So this is a massive triceratops. It was encased in sandstone about a foot down. When we pulled it out, there was water pooled underneath the, uh, underneath the base because see, it's not far enough down to prevent from any kind of rainwater infiltration. Again, exposed on the end even. So, so it wasn't like it was encased in some kind of plastic or, or lead container. It was, it was exposed to the elements. So the water was able to get to it, which as we saw, that's how fossils form. With that's water how fossils and form. And silica. water is also, a very, as part of the fossil forming process, water is very devastating to tissue. So that water is going to cause that tissue to, to decay exactly. very quickly. Exactly. It's going to replace it with the ground minerals and it's going to decay the tissue. So water would be the last thing you would want your fossil exposed to if you're trying to preserve the tissue after you've formed the fossil. From this horn, this was found. This is a slab of stretchable tissue. And in fact, on this are cells. These are bone cells that you would find commonly in bone. So that's magnified, a, a this piece is of magnified. tissue this magnified, is magnified under, greatly. This is under okay. a microscope, yeah. Okay. This was published on the cover of American Laboratory. And then if you look at these cells even under higher magnification, this is what they would look like. This is published in our own quarterly. Notice the very unique features of these cells, these are what we call osteocytes. These are a specific class of bone cells. And that's how we know they're osteocytes because they're very unique in their appearance. So we can see from this, these are dinosaur cells. These are dinosaur bone cells. Dinosaur bone cells look like cow, horse, and dog bone cells because osteocytes in vertebrate animals all look the same. So this gives us evidence that dinosaurs fit in the same basic categorizations as all the rest of animals. So, so these aren't you know, mineral replacements to, to what maybe we would just say is flesh. This is the actual cells of the skin, right? Of the bone. Of the bone, this is that's bone right. bone cells. Bone cells. Yes, in fact, this right here and this right here are what are called filipodia. 
and filopodia are extensions that come out from the membrane. What almost looks like hairs coming off yes, of there. That's, exactly. Okay. And yet, if these are supposed to be almost 70 million years old, you still have these very, very fragile appendages from these cells. You would expect those to go first. Oh, absolutely. I, I know hair starts to go at a certain age. Yes, so yes. I would go. think yes. on bone cells. <laughs> yes. You, you would expect these to have deteriorated a long time ago. Yes. Well, what do evolutionists say about this? This is fascinating because how do they get around this? Well, they have a number of explanations that they, that they attempt to go into of, of explaining, but a lot of it has to do with, well, we just got to preserve it in the right condition, but they're still searching for the right so condition. So there's somehow some way that somehow, some freak some accident yes. happened. Okay. Yes. Here's another fossil that we worked with. It's a Thessalosaurus vertebra. In fact, this is the whole vertebrae column, and the, the museum that was digging it up this end piece right here was so fractured that they didn't want it. So they just encased it in plaster, wrapped it in aluminum foil, and put it on a shelf in a shed. And there it sat for years. And then a young lady named Natalia Moody, who was an intern for a while at this museum, wanted to learn something about soft tissue. So she came down to my lab to intern and do work with soft tissue. And she brought this in piece with her wow. just to look at. You know, nothing special, just here's a little piece you can have because we don't want it because it's too broken up. And so no special preservation whatsoever. And she was digging around on the, under the microscope and I told her to stop. I turned the camera on and this is what she found. Well, that doesn't look like rock to me. No, that is definitely not rock. That is tissue I can off see of that see it stretching. Yeah. Thessalosaurus vertebra. And then once she pulled it off and we cleaned it up some, mm. this is then what it looked like. Now, what do you say about something like that? When you see that and she sees that, I mean, what's your reaction? Well, of course, my reaction is that you're not going to be able to justify any mechanism of explaining how this tissue survived millions of years. You know, tens of millions yes, of years. Yes, yes. And like I say, this is, this is not a teeny microscopic piece of tissue. You can see how large that is. I mean, yes, it's still magnified, but this is... But this you can is, see those forceps yes. there or whatever they are, yes. tweezers. I mean, right. it's, they're big enough to where you could see that with your naked eye. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. This was a very large piece of tissue she pulled off. And that's completely inconsistent with the claim that this Thessalosaurus vertebra would have been some 70 million years. Evolutionists must be horrified to see this. I mean, I hate it's, to say it that it, way. You would think they would be thrilled, but they're probably right. very, it's very- It's a struggle. It's a struggle. Wow. Yes. Well, Dr. Anderson, we just saw an incredible piece of video, uh, a video showing the cells, the, the tissue mm -hmm. of a dinosaur, mm -hmm. soft tissue. Mm -hmm. What is the significance of that? Well, the significance is that it's very hard to argue that the tissue would still be there after tens of millions of years. So if you're going to say these fossils are you know, 60, 70, 80, 100, 150 million years old, you have to explain how the tissue stayed in there because that certainly is inconsistent with everything we know about biological degradation about how things degrade. And, and the specimens that you referred to, I mean, they weren't encased in amber, no, no, you know, or in some not. other, you know, yes, crazy yes. Pr preservation were, material. No special preservation. We're sitting in water, yes, in yes. sandstone. Yes, sitting in a pool of water because rainwater could infiltrate it, absolutely. In fact, it doesn't end there. There's additional studies that have found, for example, there's pliable tissue in a variety of dinosaur fossils found all around the world. So it's not just, it's not a, just specific, one or two right, freak it's not just a specific location of a specific few specific fossils, right? It's a number of fossils found in a number of different places all around the world. How many would you say right now, like that they found, how many different dinosaur specimens have they found soft tissue in? I think it's close, to, if I recall, I think it's close to 40. Different dinosaur. 40 different examples. Yeah, of dinosaur. And each one has to be an astronomical freak, according to yes. evolutionary science. And then you get into other so-called ancient fossils, the number gets closer to 100. Wow. So 100 uh, specimens where it should be completely fossilized, and yet we're finding soft tissue, we're finding blood yes. cells, we're finding bone yes. cells. Yes. 
and they have to say in each one, well, that's just an enormously impossible exception that just well, happened. They have, <laughs> they have to say that there was some unique preservation event going yeah, on. A hundred times. And and yeah, who, who knows yeah. how many more? It's no longer keep... unique if it's, if it's all over the place. Wow. Yes. Plus, see, morphologically distinct cells are present in the tissue. Multiple labs now have shown this. We also have from other studies that fragments of collagen, remember that's the most common protein that you're going to find in bone, is still detected. You can still detect fragments of collagen. Now, protein should have been gone a long time ago, and they recognized that. That was the very fragile that we looked at, right? Some of those. But the proteins are even more fragile because they found other proteins, such as actin, myosin, tubulin. These are even more fragile than collagen. Mm. So whatever explanation they try to raise to say, well, collagen could maybe survive that long, which it really can't. You can't begin to say that with actin and myosin, for example. Mary Schweitzer, who is a very popular, very frequent researcher in this topic, uh, she's the one that's probably been the most dominant in the field. In an interview a few years ago, she said that, quote, this leaves us with two alternatives for interpretation. Either the dinosaurs' fossils aren't as old as we think they are, or we don't know exactly how these things get preserved. Which is fair enough. Okay, yeah. They're either not that old or there's some special mechanism going on that we don't understand. But here's the problem with what she said. The idea that dinosaurs aren't as old as we think they are, see, that's not even allowed on the table. Yeah, no, that topic I can't is imagine closed. they could. They yes, could. exactly. We're not talking about 68 million to maybe 58 million. We're, right, we're talking about 68 million to 6,800. Yeah. 68 million to 3,000. Yeah, yeah, and they, they're not, that they topic is there. not allowable, no. Mm. So it's back to, well, just how do they get preserved? And they're going to offer various ideas of how to get preserved, which, as I say, maybe get you a million or two, mm -hmm. but they're not going to get you 70, 80, 90 million. The old excuse of, well, we don't know now, but someday, someday. you know, materialistic someday. science will figure yeah. it out. And of course, science is not based upon someday. Science is not based on what you hope to find. Mm -hmm. Scientific conclusions are based strictly upon what you know today. Mm. Uh, Miles Eldridge made a very interesting comment that I think is a applies to this. He says, the expectation of theory colors perception to such a degree that new notions seldom arise from facts collected under the influence of old pictures of the world. The expectations. Yes. We know Jurassic is this old. We know dinosaurs lived this long ago. So it doesn't make a difference what evidence you find. It doesn't make any difference what kind of scientific data you provide. We already know. So yeah. literally don't confuse us with the facts our mind is made up. Our mind is made up because it has to be this way in order for evolution to be true. Correct. That's really what Correct. they're protecting. And evolution becomes the overriding paradigm for all interpretations. If it fits evolution, it's the proper interpretation. If it does not fit evolution, it's the wrong interpretation. So if, if, it, if it goes with evolution, it's allowed. Yes. If it says evolution yes. might not be true, we're not even allowed we're to not consider even it. We're going to consider it, wow. exactly. And I thought science actually went by evidence and facts. It's supposed to, but mm. science is performed by humans. And humans and are biased. And humans are very biased. Mm. Well, I want to thank you for being on the show, it's Dr. My Anderson. Pleasure. Yes. It was very enlightening. You know, as we looked at what we saw today, I hope you were surprised. I hope you were even amazed. According to evolutionary theory, the dinosaurs died out 68 million years ago. That means it's just not possible for there to be soft tissue, to be bone cells, blood cells that are found that are from dinosaurs. And now we have about 100 examples. When are they going to say that they're wrong? It, it turns out, as we're seeing the facts and the evidence, the real Jurassic world is not the world of Charles Lyell. It's not the world of Charles Darwin. The real Jurassic world is the world of the Bible. They just don't want to say it. But we know here on this program that what the Bible says is true. And since we go by the evidence, we know that the proof is all around you. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Origins, and we'll see you next time.